Good afternoon and welcome to this absolutely wonderful weekend with HBU's organ dedication and Box Bible in our Cultural Arts Center in the Dunham Bible Museum and a very special lecture. I have a couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, since this is such a very special day, after Dr. Rawson's lecture, we would like to invite all of you to a very special reception for Dr. Rawson and for Mr. Bell, who will be giving an organ concert at 5 o'clock, which does include a piece by Bach, and you all are also welcome to stay for the organ concert. Also, as I hope many of you know, we do have Bach's personal Bible on exhibit at the Dunham Bible Museum just right across the hall. If you have not visited there, please make a point to, uh, I mean, it has never been to Texas, and who knows when it's coming again. So you do want to make sure that you see Bach's Bible and take the opportunity to see the many other wonderful uh, Bibles and learn something about the history of the Bible that we have in the museum. Well, Johann Sebastian Bach is certainly known as a musical genius, and his music is celebrated worldwide. But it's not his musical genius that really makes him the most important. He truly followed the Lord's admonition through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 9, when he said, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. That Bach gloried in knowing God can be seen in his study of the scriptures. And to help us better understand Bach and his study of God's word, we are very pleased to have with us this afternoon Dr. Tom Rosen. Dr. Rosen is a composer, a church musician, and the founder and conductor of the choral group Exultate. Founded in 1996, Exultate is a chamber orchestra and choir based in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Under Dr. Rosen's direction, Exultate has performed and recorded such major works as Brahms' Requiem, The Seven Last Words of Christ, Mozart's Grand Mass in C minor, and the Mass in B minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. Dr. Rawson holds the Master of Fine Arts degree in choral conducting from the University of Minnesota and the Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Minnesota. His doctoral dissertation topic, and you can see his doctoral dissertation on a table outside of the Bible Museum, was on the analysis of the marginal notations made by Johann Sebastian Bach in his personal Bible. And he will be sharing some of those discoveries with us this afternoon, so please, Welcome, Dr. Tom Rawson. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am thrilled to be here, and I thank Dr. Severance for making it possible for me to tell you more about Bach's personal Bible than you probably want to know. I've spent many hundreds of hours working with each of the 4,000 pages in this Bible and have come to know it and know Bach better than I ever could have. Hopefully, my enthusiasm for what I discovered will make you excited too. Johann Sebastian Bach was simply the finest composer of all time, and his work clearly derived from his personal faith makes his offering of music even more important and, and exciting than ever. As Germans and Protestants, we have no greater prophets than these two, Luther and Bach. Such are the words of Julius Smend in his monograph comparing Bach and Luther. Martin Luther, the great Refor Reformation leader, was a consummate theologian with a fine understanding of church music, having written several hymns and even helped, along with the, his close friend Johann Walter, to publish several hymns in the, book, in the German vernacular. On the other hand, Johann Sebastian Bach was a superb church musician with a clear grasp of Lutheran theology. It is evident that the musician Luther is much less known than Luther the theologian, just as Bach the theologian is much less known than Bach the musician. The 259 years since the death of Johann Sebastian Bach have produced more of a distance than merely that of time 
when it comes to understanding the raison d'etre of Bach's church music. In Bach's time, the fervor of belief in Jesus Christ was still very strong and viable. As Kretzmann described, the tide of faith was still full and strong, and the Western world had not yet decided to believe in unbelief. The fact is, the theological world of Bach in Leipzig during the 18th century was relatively stable and theologically quiet, at least in Leipzig, in which church music composed and performed as a witness to, of a strong religious conviction could be easily heard and indeed loved by the church community. Of course, not all who heard Bach's music could understand it in all its intricacies, just as now, but it's clear that the truths of the Lutheran Christian faith were expressed in his music, music which often comes as close to the textual thought as the text themselves. His use of the initials JJ, Jesu Yuva, Jesus Help Me, or STGL, Soli Deo Gloria, To God Alone Be the Glory, at the beginning and ending of numerous compositions must be regarded as a sincere, true, and humble expression from a composer with a firm and deeply rooted faith. The wall of time which separates Bach's world from that of the 21st century has and continues to contribute to the trend towards a disassociation of Bach's use of his text choices with that of his personal religious de devotion. The mind and spirit of 18th century Germany is difficult to understand by the 21st century. For example, the life of a church musician today in comparison to one in the 18th century can serve to show a vast difference in concept as well as in deed. A Lutheran church musician of 18th century Germany was required to pass a rigorous examination of not only his musical skills, including the almost lost art of improvisation, but also his grasp of Orthodox Lutheran doctrine. This type of theological examination, rarely required in the 21st century, proved to the future employer that the candidate had a faith rooted in the Bible, the Augsburg Confessions, and other theological and doctrinal positions of the Lutheran Church. Johann Sebastian Bach, on several occasions in search of employment, passed through these examinations with no apparent difficulty. Since the 21st century, musician is rarely required to give confession of his faith or her faith in order to secure a position, and since the very profession of a church musician is certainly much less demanding than its counterpart of Bach's day, it's not difficult to comprehend the lack of understanding as to what a church musician was in Bach's time. The wall between Bach's world and the world of our century is also evident in the personal relationship which Bach had with his profession, that of a church musician. Great music composed in, to, and for the glory and service of the Lord is essentially foreign to most within our 21st century way of life. Thus, modern humanity is seemingly unable to accept the fact that Johann Sebastian Bach the man of, was a man of faith. It's not, it is for this reason that some musicologists have understand, understandably, although mistakenly, separated Bach's Christian faith from his sacred compositions. Friedrich Blume, in his now infamous lecture delivered at the Bach Festival of the International Bach Society in Mainz, Germany, on June 1, 1962, made a scholarly attempt to discredit the personal faith of Bach, and therefore also the notion that Bach the composer was also Bach the theologian. Based on the lack of convincing evidence in the form of documents concerning the personal life of, of Bach, he spoke without knowing the existence of the Kalof Bible. Blume dismissed the theologian Bach and opted for a composer who wrote out of occupational necessity. He worked for a church. What else would he, was he going to write? That doesn't prove that he's a Christian. He said, Bach, the supreme cantor, the creative servant of the word of God, the staunch Lutheran, is a legend. In fact, concedes, uh, contends Blume, Bach even turned his back on the church in 1708 when he desired a court appointment. And it was, quote, Spitta who turned Bach into the great Lutheran cantor, the retrospective champion of tradition, the orthodox preacher of the Bible and the chorale, who still prevails in the popular imagination today. Numerous works, oratorios, masses, and cantatas 
were not written with the intention of proclaiming the composer's Christian faith, still less from a heartfelt need to do so. These statements, novel at the time, have led to an increased separation of Bach's music from his faith and have contributed to the decline in sacred liturgical performances of his works. In spite of this trend, recent research, especially the discovery and analysis of the Kaloff Bible, is indicating with greater exactitude that Bach, Bach's heretofore apparent adherence to Lutheran theology was even greater than had been surmised. Bach's music cannot be separated from the Christian truths which are so eloquently displayed through his choice of text and their marriage with the music. And now we have the Bach Bible to prove that he really believed what he was writing. The personal library of Bach, according to the inventory drawn up after his death in 1750, contained many volumes of theological writings. This fact, coupled with the knowledge of his personal additions and comments in the Kaloff Bible, indicate that Bach was a serious theologian and not merely a collector of theological books, with the probability that additional volumes from his library will be uncovered, more light may be shed on Bach the theologian. At present, however, only the three-volume Kaloff Bible, most likely acquired by Bach near the year of 1733, helps us in that endeavor. Two of the three volumes are here. They never allow all three to go at once. If the plane crashes, they're all gone. So you'll never see three together unless you go to uh, the Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and there it's rarely on display either. It's in, in, a, bank, in a, a vault. The facts surrounding the discovery of the Akalaf Bible owned by Johann Sebastian Bach provide an interesting story. Documents surrounding the discovery and subsequent acquisition of the Bible by Concordia Seminary uh, are extant and reside in the library at the seminary. Here's the story. In June of 1934, the Reverend Christian Riedel of Detroit, Michigan, attended the Michigan District Convention of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. It was held in Frankenmuth, Michigan. This Missouri Synod pastor was housed on the farm of his cousin, Leonard Reichel. While staying at the farm home of Reichel's, Riedel was shown the third volume of the Kaloff Bible, the same one that we have right here. It had been in the family since 1830 when it was purchased in Philadelphia. They had no idea what they had. In 1830, Bach's name was not a household name like it is now. He wasn't discovered until about 1850, so an unknown. Uh, it had been in, in, since in the 1830s, it had been in the family when it was purchased at a books, book uh, dealer in Philadelphia. The Reichel family moved from Pennsylvania to Michigan in 1847, and in 1879, on the de upon the death of Leonard Reichel's father, the three-volume set came into the possession of Leonard Reichel. Having seen the title page with the Bach monogram clearly displayed in the lower right margin, and you can see that uh, in volume two that's displayed out here. And upon his return to Detroit, Riedel wrote his friend Paul Sauer, the pastor of First St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Chicago. Sauer had been, coincidentally, the first president of the Chicago Bach Chorus in 1926. There ensued correspondence between Sauer and Reichel in an attempt to find the two remaining volumes. They were reported lost by Reichel in September of 1934. In November of 1934, Reichel reported that the remaining two volumes had indeed been found in a trunk in the attic of the house. All three volumes contained the signature of Johann Sebastian Bach. Word was sent to Hans Preuss in Erlangen, Germany. He was the Bach, the Bach scholar at the time concerning the find and attempt to authenticate the volumes. They were indeed authenticated. Then on November 2nd, 1935, an article appeared in the Detroit News describing the events surrounding the discovery of the volumes. Paul Sauer, in a letter to Walter Buzin, takes issue with a number of the discrepancies found within that article. And it's not, it's not accurate at all. Over the next four years, Riedel and Sauer attempted to convince Reichel to send the volumes to the Bach House in Eisenach, Germany, the birthplace of Bach. Reichel, this staunch Missouri Synod conservative farmer, said, no way. What was happening in Germany at that time, the Nazis were coming to power, 
and he could not be convinced to give it to the Germans. Finally, in 1938, he decided it was more prudent to give the Kaloff Bible to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. There, they promptly put it on their rare book shelf in their rare book room and forgot about it. So twice now, we've forgotten about it. It wasn't until about 1962 uh, that someone actually uh, looked at it in seriousness. No longer can it be not denied that Bach was a devout man of faith or that he was a serious student of scripture. The existence of the Kaloff Bible proves that he had strong religious convictions and that he took very seriously his study of scripture. It also adds to the knowledge of the personal character characteristics and qualities of the composer outside of his vocation of church musician. His intellectual prowess and inquisitiveness and his predilection towards an insistence on accuracy and scholarship. So we learn much about the man Bach that we didn't know. More complete knowledge concerning Bach's personal life is, a, is of great importance. The daily struggles of the world's giants are often glossed over by the tremendous contributions with which they have adorned human existence. Since human beings tend to immortalize gifted individuals, it's often possible that students of history see and grasp only the lofty nature of these individuals. By discovering the human frailties, the personal failures, the difficulties and joys of gifted individuals, musicians can place themselves in perspective within the world around them. This giant, Johann Sebastian Bach, had the same human needs and the same human foibles characteristic of all of us. By adding to our knowledge of the personal life of Bach, conductors, performers, and listeners can understand his creative activities more completely and in turn can hope to understand the artistic and creative energies within themselves. By knowing more of the struggles of Bach in his attempt to produce creative works and the method he possibly used to deal with those frustrations, musicians can understand more clearly the difficulty artists have in bringing to fruition great works of art. I'm a musician. It helps me to know that he had struggles. Any information which can be added to the already existing body of knowledge concerning Johann Sebastian Bach is important and essential to continued intellectual growth of musicians who perform the music of this composer. In the end, knowing more about J.S. Bach's personal life can add immeasurably to the aesthetic enjoyment of his music. There are two important published studies concerning the Kaloff Bible owned by Bach. The first, published in 1985, is J.S. Bach and Scripture, Glosses from the Kaloff Bible by Robin Lever. In his book, Lever outlines some of the marginalia found in the Kaloff Bible. He provides translations and photographs of some of the entries made by Bach and provides a commentary about some of the subject matter of the marginalia. This book also contains a good description of the discovery of the Kaloff Bible. The importance of this study can be found in the description of the connections with other volumes in Bach's library. A major criticism of the study is that it contains a very incomplete description of the marginalia and is highly inaccurate and therefore scholarship is in question. The mo most glaring inaccuracy deals with the mistaken identity of the biblical source of some of the annotations. Bach marks 90, pa 90 different passages within the book of Ecclesiastes. This re represents almost 25% of the 300-some 300 mark markings found within the three-volume set. Lever identifies every one of the ecclesiastic marginalia to be from the book of Proverbs. In mislabeling these important markings, Lever has eliminated the most important body of entries by Bach. The wisdom of the theologian Abraham Kallach within the commentary sections of the book of Ecclesiastes is a source of great interest on the part of the composer. It is here where we find the most concentrated section of advice from Abraham Kallach concerning personal relations with people and authorities placed over others. Evidence shows that Bach must have gained some insight into his own personal conduct and the manner in which he worked and in interacted with those around him by reading the text of the commentary in Ecclesiastes. The second study, which has been published concerning the Kaloff Commentary Bible owned by Bach, is The Kaloff Bible of J.S. Bach by Howard Cox. This is an important document. It is a description of the proton millibrobe uh, analysis of the hand-penned annotations within the Kaloff Bible. 
Through ink analysis, it was possible to determine which entries were authentic by examining the chemical structure of the ink used by Bach. After all, if, if you underline something and then hand it to somebody else and ask them, okay, who underlined it? You don't know. If you write something in the margin in a handwriting, you can identify that. But you can't identify an underlining or a quote, uh, etc. By matching known bar bar marginalia with underlinings and otherwise impossible to determine annotations to ter determine if the same ink was used, it was possible to ter determine the authenticity of each entry. The Cox study lends credence to my own study by proving that the markings described within are from the hand of Bach. The Cox study is limited to ink analysis and facsimiles of some of the microfilm of the Kalof Bible. Now, a word must be said about Abraham Kalof, the editor and commentator of this Bible. This Bible uh, is about this thick if you put all three volumes together, and you'll see how large these, these, these books are if you look at it. Uh, it's, it's basically a verse of scripture followed by a little sermon. Verse, sermon, verse, sermon, verse, sermon, through entire scripture. A 17th century theologian of very high regard, Caliph was a very prolific writer and has, been, and has been described as, quote, the most brilliant and influential theologian of the silver age of Lutheran orthodoxy, a veritable pillar of orthodox Lutheranism. Living from 1612 to 1686, Kalof wrote many theological commentaries, tracts, doctrinal position statements, polemical writings, and other theological volumes. He was a controversial figure of his time as he wrote much of his work in reaction to the rise and strength of pietism and was considered by many to be a dogmatist. It's especially important to realize that his commentary on scripture here studied, studied draws very heavily from the works of Luther. A very orthodox approach to the interpretation of scripture is clearly evident throughout the commentary. As an orthodox Lutheran Christian, Bach most certainly felt he was reading, quote, the true interpretation. The marginal notations were classified by me into categories of subject matter based on the text marked by Bach. Some of the subject areas are things like this, corrections, authority or government relations, personal guidance and suggested solutions to earthly problems, markings not by Bach, personal life and morality, personal relations with others, vocation or employment relations, music, justice and law, sin and its consequences, liturgical or ceremonial tradition or custom, death and eschatology, mathematics or numerical data. Through a translation and analysis of the marginalia and annotated sections of this commentary Bible, fresh appreciation was gained concerning the interest Bach had in theology and biblical matters, his intellectual prowess and inquisitiveness, and his predilection towards an in intense insistence on accuracy and scholarship. The many entries in Bach's hand are evidence of the personal thoughts and beliefs of this great composer during the, during the time of the or origin of the marginalia. Imagine this. You own a Bible. Hopefully you all own a Bible. Your own Bible. And you read it. And sometimes you underline some things. And sometimes you put a note in the margin. Or sometimes you put things in quotes. Or sometimes you put you arrows. Or see this. Or, or something remind you of. Uh, that's exactly what Bach did. And it was not meant for anyone else. It was his own personal study. That's why this is such an important document. We have nothing else that comes close to it in all of the papers and all of the music that we have from Johann Sebastian Bach. All, everything else is, quote, more public as an official duty. We have nothing that's really personal, almost like a diary from Johann Sebastian Bach. So for the first time, after the discovery of this, we have, a, we have a look into the man himself, not obscured by his profession and his outer life. The marginality were categorized into divisions based on the subject matter of the text marked. Out of those determined to be authentic, annotations made by the composer, 348 markings, more than 50% 
deal with the subject of personal relations with individuals and those in authority. 24% were corrections of the biblical or Kalof commentary text, and the remaining annotations were split between the subject categories of music, sin, death, and those not categorized. Markings not categorized were varied in their subject matter, ranging from simple underlinings uh, of names to comments concerning the Aaronic blessing. Within his personal Bible, there are substantial amounts of evidence that contribute to the conclusion that Bach was one who was serious in his religious and personal faith. Before the Kalaf Bible was discovered, it was conjectured that Bach was a serious student of scripture. It has always been apparent that he used a Bible to choose texts for some of his vocal works. The six motets, movements for some of the cantatas, and the passion settings all use texts drawn directly from scripture. It could only be stated with any certainty, however, that he consulted the Bible for texts and not that he actually studied scripture for any personal reason exclusive of his musical vocation. In 1962, Bluma was perfectly correct, correct in championing the thesis that there was really very little evidence of a personal faith on the part of Bach. There simply was little empirical data. There were previous indications of a deep faith, but nothing as conclusive or as convincing as the Kalof Bible. The personal library of Bach, according to the inventory drawn up after his death in 1750, contained at least 81 volumes of theological writings. Of these, a formidable number for a theologian of the time to possess, much less a church musician, at least 20 are, the volume, are volumes of writings of Martin Luther, including two complete editions of, Mar of Luther's works both the Jena edition and the Altenburg edition. Many of the remaining volumes are either biblical commentaries or collections of sermons by distinguished Lutheran theologians of the time. This fact, coupled with the knowledge of his personal editions and comments, as well as numerous corrections in his Bible, indicate that Bach was a man with a profound religious faith who searched his own copies of scripture during personal study. In fact, there are places where he corrects a biblical text. One volume is open to that, where you can see on the left, in the left-hand margin, symbols that he writes, and then a word next to it, a symbol and a few words, and another symbol, different symbol. And then in the second column over, you'll see those symbols, meaning that's exactly where that text should be inserted. Texts that were missing from the Bible in the printing process. And he's very careful about it. He does about where he puts it in. Personally studying, which means he had to have another Bible sitting next to him. And he had to have Luther's works because he comments, and there are places where he finishes off what Luther actually said, where Kaloff is quoting Luther, and Kaloff doesn't finish it, and Luther does. So here, you imagine, it's a big, big desk, and Bach sitting with, there with this, this thick Bible, and, a, and another Bible here, and Luther's works here, studying on his own. There have always been other indications that Bach was a devout Christian, but none as convincing as his own copy of Scripture. His use of the initials JJ, Jesus Help Me, or the SDGL, To God Alone Be the Glory, at the beginning and ending of numerous compositions, cannot be dismissed as merely complying with the convention of the time. They, in fact, were not a standard hallmark of religious manuscripts in Bach's day. The phrase uh, in, in German to honor the highest God and by doing so to instruct one's neighbor, found on the title page of the Orko Büchlein, is not just a casual statement, but an expression of a true belief in God. His several letters in which he speaks of a well-regulated church music cannot be construed to indicate exclusively a desire to be in an employment situation where church music was easily performed and supported. It is more likely that he really did believe it was possible to have a well-regulated church music in which the music performed well would be done to and for the glory of God and the edification of the believer in the pew. And discovery of his Bible helps that a great deal. His choice of cantata text reveals a devotionalism which cannot be dismissed, and the music combined with these texts indicates a very serious composer striving for excellence. Never, even with the obvious haste and deadline pressures of a weekly cantata, and there are many examples of haste in copying parts or piecing together cantata movements, can there be found the routine, ordinary, or simple type of composition which would have quickly solved the need for music within a service and freedom for other agendas. 
On the contrary, despite these pressures, the music and text chosen are consistently of the highest quality, a quality worthy of an offering to God. Picture this. Bach arrives in Leipzig, and there, it may be, according to the, the, uh, the cantata outlines of, or the dating of the cantatas, that there was a, a two, three, or four-year period where he was writing a cantata every single Sunday. Now, this is a six, seven, eight, eight movement work lasting 20 to 30 to 40 minutes every week. And the quality is of the highest regard, every one of them. That's unbelievable in our, standard, in our standards and even unbelievable at that time. The addition of the Kaloff Bible to this existing body of knowledge adds a great deal of support for the belief that Bach was indeed seriously interested in theological concerns. Not only did he own the Kaloff Commentary Bible, but he used it, he read it, he made markings in it, and he commented on his readings. This must be construed to mean that he was, a, he was serious about his personal faith. In fact, if no music existed from Bach, and there were no other documents concerning him except his own personal copy of scripture, the conclusion could easily be drawn that he was a theologian, or at least a person who was a serious student of scripture. The evidence in this Bible points solidly to the conclusion that Bach had a personal relationship with God. He actually believed what he was doing. No longer can there be any doubt similar to those of Bluma about the composer writing out of occupational necessity and not necessarily religious piety. The Kaloff Bible contents prove that there is no division between Bach, the devout Christian, and Bach, the church musician. His continual vexation and impediments in the area of church music were not found in his faith, but rather in the worldly agents of that faith. One only has to interpret the marginal comments found within the pages of his Bible to come to this conclusion. The four most obvious annotations where Bach deliberately expresses tenets of his belief serve to indicate this depth of faith. They are not casual comments on the text he is studying, but rather careful observations concerning the place of music within the context of worship. If historical performance practice is important, then Bach's clear intentions for his music as indicated in these quotations, must be known by conductors and performers and listeners. In other words, it should change the way we perform the works of Bach by knowing the raison behind his writing. They are quotations which must be widely disseminated and attached to performances of his church music. Quote, in devotional music, God is always present with his grace. That's Bach writing in his own Bible. The reference is to 2 Chronicles 5. Festival prelude for two choirs to be sung to the glory of God. Written in the margin next to Exodus 15, verse 20. This chapter is the true foundation of all God-pleasing church music. Reference in the, in the margin to 1 Chronicles 25. A marvelous proof that besides the other arrangements of the divine service, especially music was prescribed by the Spirit of God through David. Reference 1 Chronicles 28. What has always been assumed on the basis of the content of his church music, that Bach was a devout person who not only knew his Bible, but also applied its teachings to his professional private life, can now be counted as proven, period. His personal copy of scripture is a register of his devotion and his faith. Another conclusion which can be drawn from this study is that the Kaloff Bible is a personal record of Bach's interest in certain subjects and life struggles, at least during the time of the marginalia, and a record of his search for answers to perplexing problems and frustrating situations. There is no proof of the date of the acquisition of the Bible. Assuming that he acquired it in 1733, he signs each, each, each copy in the front page, J.S. Bach, 1733. Assuming that he acquired it in 1733 or, or some year near that time, evidenced by the date he inscribed on the title page, uh, can only be conjecture. Because of the contents of the entries, it would seem more plausible that he acquired it in some years earlier, possibly as early as 1726, 
the probable date of the motet Zingetem Herrn. At any rate, one can infer a connection between what he has, was studying in scripture and what he was experiencing in his own life at the time. If it was 1733, that date corresponds within a year to the employment of, of Ernesti, Bach's source of great consternation. Shortly after 1734, there began to be a long and bitter dispute between Bach and the rector of St. Thomas School, Johann August Ernesti. This dispute caused a great deal of grief and frustration for Bach, and he continued, continually battled with Ernesti. It's probable that Bach, feeling little or no support from his employers, sought comfort and advice from his scriptures. Given his obvious interest in scripture and the many markings found within the annotated sections concerning the subject of authority or personal relations, this is not an illogical conclusion. When I first looked at these three volumes, I was taken to a room at Concordia Seminary, and they saw I was serious about the study, and so they allowed me to not have to work with the microfilm to actually work, work with the real thing. They brought me to a room. I could use a pen, a pencil, and a piece of paper, and that was it. It was climate controlled. They brought all three volumes in, put them on the table, left and locked me in the room. And there I was with Johann Sebastian Bach. And I pored over these, these pages for hours and hours and hours trying to figure out what he was doing. When I realized, finally realized, that at some point he was doing a word study on authority, I was in tears. Because here we had in front of us Bach who was struggling with his employers, writing church music galore every week, and just tons of it, and wonderful, wonderful music. And we've all known that after about 1734, he basically stopped writing church music for a long time until the last three or four years of his life, besides occasional pieces. But this huge, massive output comes to an end right about there. And we never knew why. Also, it also corresponds with the time he started going to, to Zimmerman's coffee house and, and creating works of art that were, were quote, secular, although, although to Bach, all his music was sacred, but instrumental things without texts. Well, I realized that he was actually doing a, a word study on authority. More than 50% of the marginal entries deal with personal relationships. This cannot be happenstance. Receiving little help or advice from those around him, he turned to his Bible for solace, comfort, wisdom, and advice. His particular affinity towards those Kaloff comments which deal with how a Christian ought to act in relationship with others points to the likelihood that he was suffering personally because of relationships gone sour and negative situations with his employment. And that was, that was where my tears came. The tears were because I thought, what do we not have from Bach that we would have had had he had a better relationship with those people? After all, the history of his not getting along well with his employers, it's well documented. He was consistently in difficult relationship with others. Even from the beginning of his employment, it's clear that he was in con continual state of vexation with his employers. If he was as, uh, as devout as is evident, this most certainly was a source of great consternation and personal suffering for Bach. Turning to his Bible for advice was a logical approach for a devout Christian. And what he found in there is that Kaloff over and over and over again says in different ways, those people who are placed above you are placed there by God, and you must obey them. And so we find at that very time in his life, he says, all right, I will do that because that is my duty. And he does his duty to the, in, at the church, has fine music, doesn't write a lot of, of choral music anymore for there, but then he also branches out and goes to Zimmerman's coffee house and writes other things. Another conclusion which can be drawn from this study is that Bach was a serious scholar, or at least had a scholarly approach to his study of scripture. It is clear that Bach studied and knew scripture. One of the marginal notations in Bach's hand demonstrates his keen knowledge of scripture and his careful scholarship. Next to Leviticus 18, verse 16, which warns against having sexual relations with your brother's wife, Bach places a note which says, says NB, nota bene. This seems to be contrary to the law which, that required that a brother is to raise seed for his brother when he dies. 
His note has a direct relationship with Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, which echoes the same instruction. No casual reader of the Bible could hope to remember such a scriptural passage of obvious limited use. However, Bach demonstrates the depth of his understanding of scripture through this example. It's always been known that Bach was a genius in music. That's clearly evident. But in matters outside his own compositional scores, there's little compelling evidence of a scholarly nature or a careful attention to detail. There does exist the small body of correspondence, which we have, have from his pen, and these do indicate that he was an intelligent individual who could express himself accurately and clearly. The Kaloff Bible adds to that knowledge by displaying the composer's attention to even minute details. The mere fact that he had to have a second copy of the scripture with him in order to make corrections of the biblical text indicates some measure of seriousness on his part. He physically had to, upon finding a missing verse, look it up in another copy of the Bible and then copy it from the, uh, of, out that text from one book to the other. It must have been extremely important for him to have an accurate and complete Bible in his possession. He correct, his corrections of the printer's errors and omissions within the pages of his Bible served to prove the seriousness with which he approached his study of Scripture. They also served to paint a more complete picture of a man with a strong drive for excellence, even outside of his vocation of music. We probably could not have lived with him. A perfectionist. Corrections of spelling errors, missing words within a verse of Scripture, and additions of missing verses perhaps allude to a personal compulsion and insistence of accuracy in matters great and small. This personality trait was evident in his dealings with the authorities in Leipzig. Several times they took issue with his narrow interpretation of his contract as a cantor. He was insisting on, quote, the letter of the law. This trait is confirmed by his meticulous correcting of errors in his own Bible. So careful was he that he devised a set of symbols to use in order to identify the exact location of entries. And you'll see a cop of us example of that in the Bible out here. His underlinings are very carefully executed. His use of quotation marks on the sides of the columns of texts he deemed important is consistently carefully placed. His placement of the letters NB, note bene, is always directly in line with what he thought was important. In truth, Bach goes to great lengths to be sure his markings, prob probably to be read by no one but himself, are very clear and accurate and that his corrections are complete and can be easily identified. It's also interesting to note that his careful attention to his copy of scripture must have been a priority within his own being. Was he as careful with other important manuscripts within his possession, especially his compositions? On the contrary, there is little evidence of his care in compiling or keeping safe his many cantata manuscripts. The fact that there are so many lost manuscripts is probably due in part to Bach's own neglect. Because a cantata was composed and performed for a specific, specific occasion at which the text was appropriate, usually based on the gospel for the day, and the music written was conceived for a specific available force of musicians on that day, it's very likely that Bach had little concern for the disposition of the score after it was used. He had little awareness in preserving his works for posterity. He never attempted to publish his cantatas. Although some movements found their way into later works, it's very clear that cantatas as a whole were written to be used for the, for the moment, Gebrauchsmusik. In striking contrast to this stands his Kaloff Bible, in which he seemed to be very careful about marking cleanly and clearly and keeping it preserved for, late, for later reference. Even to this day, the three volumes are completely intact. Every single page is there in all three volumes, every page, except for the first volume. If you open a book, the first page is always blank. It's just an empty page. That page is missing in volume one, we thought. All of us musicologists and historians worked on these things for all these years and we all thought it was lost. But lo and behold, just about five years ago, no, four years ago, uh, I had the vo first volume uh, in Minnesota uh, because we were doing a special thing and I discovered it isn't lost, it's there. It's pasted against the front cover and there's something in between. So I called up Concordia Seminary and I said, 
I think I found something. There's something in between here, and it's, it's rectangle-shaped, and there's, some, there's something hidden in this, in this book. No one had ever seen it. I called them, and I said, I'm not going to tell you what it is unless you promise that I can be the first one to write about it. They said, okay. And so we took, took it to a, a paper conservatist, and uh, this is just only four years ago. And, uh, and he, with chemicals, was able to loosen the page without damaging anything. And lo, we open up, and there on the inside cover is a portrait of Abraham Kaloff, the theologian who put together the whole thing. It's perfect. It's brand new. And it's, and it's the only portrait of that portrait of, of, of Kaloff that, that we've been able to find anywhere in the world. So it's a rare find. I, the title of my article that I write was Hiding in Plain Sight. So there's still more to be discovered. This Bible must have been very important to him, for upon his death, when his other library holdings were divided among his children and or sold for the maintenance of Anna Magdalena, his wife, it was not among those disposed but rather was kept by his wife along with one set of Luther's works. These two sets of books were in her possession at the time of her death, pointing to the value and importance place or sentimental position they had in the family. And when the list was drawn up after his death of all, the, all of his books in his library, the first entry is Kaloff Schriften Three Band. Three books, Abraham Kaloff. The first thing. The second was the list of Luther's works. Very important. Another conclusion to be drawn from the knowledge of the contents of his marginalia within the Bible is that he used his copy of Scripture as a basis for intellectual stimulation and personal edification. We have little evidence that Bach had any keen interest in science, mathematics, or politics. His interest in numbers is well documented, but this does not prove he was a mathematician. It's also known that Bach joined the Society of, the, of Musical Sciences, uh, Sciences, which was a fraternal organization whose members were learned musicians. He most certainly received intellectual stimulation from members of that society. However, he became a member only late in his life, namely in June 1747, just three years before he died. His interests in politics and those in governmental positions seems to be limited to short periods during times of consternation in which he appealed to those in governmental powers for a decision in his favor. From the evidence which exists, Bach's non-musical activities seem to focus mainly on theological concerns. Besides seeking advice and counsel from the pages of the Bible, Bach read scripture for his own enjoyment and edification. Proof of this comes from some of the personal entries made by the composer. His underlinings of the names of the sons of David in the second book of Samuel must be the result of an inquisitive mind other markings, such as a marginal notation describing a town near Erfurt, which has the same name as a well-talked-about uh, in Genesis 26, and the entries made next to verse, verses in Exodus 30, which talk about certain spices and their uses, can be strewed to be intellectual curiosities marked by Bach, who was simply enjoying his reading of Scripture. The fact that a full 70% of the personal entries in the Bible are related directly to the Kaloff commentary on the biblical verse, and not the biblical verses themselves, supports the notion that Bach was intellectually stimulated to learn more about the meaning of the biblical text he was reading. He was clearly not satisfied with only reading the scriptural passages. He truly desired to expand his knowledge of the biblical truths and the exegesis of scriptural passages written by Kaloff provided that opportunity. One could only wonder when, in his bustling schedule, he found the actual time to spend in quiet retreat in order to study scripture or any of the other theological volumes in his library. This personal intellectual curiosity is known outside of his study of scripture, but until now, no one, could, uh, one could not broaden that knowledge of an in innate curiosity to include his interest in theology. For example, his ability and keen interest in digesting the musical styles of other composers and incorporating them into his own music is well established. As early as his employment in Mühlhausen, there's evidence that he possessed a large quantity of vocal compositions from the hands of other composers. The story of his travel to Lübeck to hear Buxtehude serves to indicate his compelling interest in contemporary composers and their musical styles. The Weimar appointment offered Bach the opportunity to digest the works of Vivaldi and other Italians, and their influence can be seen in his instrumental compositions. 
He was directly influenced in his compositional process by studying the sources of Pachelbel, Frescobaldi, Handel, Hasse, Kron, Telemann, and many other contemporaries. And you know, Handel was born in Halle, which is right, right near, in the same area, Thuringia, in Germany. They were born at the same time, same year, and they never met. One time Bach was going to go meet Handel and word came back that Handel was sick, uh, so don't come, uh, and he, so he didn't. And by the way, his name is Handel, not Handel. It's Handel. And in Britain, uh, in, in Great Britain, when they even published uh, analysis and, and reviews of his, of his uh, works uh, at the time, they would spell it H-E-N-D-E-L because the A was an umlaut in Germany when he was German and he became English. It was always pronounced Handel until Americans got a hold of it. Now it's Handel, but it should be Handel. His great curiosity in the operas of Dresden caused him to travel several times with his sons, to hear performances of these new compositions filled with the new Gallant style. One can only imagine his excitement upon returning home with new ideas for the use of his style in his own compositions. The harpsichord suites are examples of this culmination uh, in that curiosity. Another point must be made to support the conclusion that Bach went to his Bible for his own edification. Only 2% of the hand pen entries in his Kalof Bible deal with the subject of music. 2%. They are important entries, but the small percentage of entries in this category, perhaps the one classification which one would expect to be at near top in the number of entries found, leads one to believe that the Kalof Bible was mainly reserved for self erudition outside the confines of his vocation as a church musician. He clearly did not use the Bible as a major source of inspiration for the creation of future musical works. There are two areas in which more research needs to be undertaken in connection with the discovery of the Bible owned by Bach. It's, a, it's certainly long past time to do a systematic and thorough search of rare theological book libraries and private holdings within the United States and European countries in search of other volumes which may have been in Bach's position. If there's anyone out there who would like to donate to sponsor me, I would love to go to libraries all over and rare book collections and search. We have a list, complete list, of everything that he had, which editions he had in his library, and no one has looked at them. And they're, they're out there somewhere, and they may be written in just like this. Wouldn't it be fabulous if we found more? With the knowledge of that, that Bach was a serious student of scripture and that he often made entries into the Bible he was reading, excitement should be heightened for the possibility that other volumes also may have entries in the hand of the composer. Since he placed his signature in the Caliph Bible, he probably also signed other books in his possession. This study could be facilitated by the knowledge of the Philadelphia sources of the Caliph Bible. Inside the book, there in the, in the front cover, there's a book dealer's marking a dollar sign and then a code, which probably was the code for the price. That needs to be looked at, traced back. Who, who was this book dealer? Where did he sell other things? Are there other, other volumes that came from Box Library that were also there? When the Reichfeld family purchased the volumes in the 1830s, the bookseller placed the catalog number or pricing symbol on the opening page. If that can be traced, we may find more. Since there still are many people who would not recognize the various signatures of Bach, the Luther volumes or perhaps some of the other books from his library are lying in homes or libraries without the knowledge of their owners. The list of books owned by Bach and their specific published editions is well known. It would simply be a matter of matching that list and then looking for Bach's handwriting. The other area which needs to be studied is the relationship between the hand penned entries in Bach's Bible and specific compositions. For example, we know of the relationship between the motet Zingetem Herrn and Bach's marginal notation next to Exodus 1520. There are no other obvious music composition relationships. However, since we know that Bach on occasion used paraphrases of certain biblical passages within his works, perhaps there are clues to be found within the Kalof commentary, which relate directly to the text employed by Bach in other compositions. With this knowledge, more could be learned about the compositional process and the choice and evolution of texts employed in his compositions. About that mark, those markings concerning Exodus 15:20, The biblical text of that verse says, 
Then Miriam the prophetess, and you have to remember, this, happened, this is just after the Israelites have passed through the Red Sea, and they look back, imagine, several hundred thousand people, and they turn and look back, and there's Pharaoh's army charging down the same path that they came, and they're scared to death. Here they come. And then the wall starts crumbling of water, and they all drown. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. They had a party. The commentary is extremely important. Although it's not underlined or marked because the NB in the margin, and because of Bach's marginal note, it's obvious that he read the commentary and responded to it. Here's what Kaloff writes. This dancing was undertaken by Miriam the prophetess in honor of God her Savior, just as King and Prophet David also danced publicly before the Ark of the Covenant and defended it against Michael, who made fun of it. That's found in Samuel uh, and other, other parts. But here, Miriam and the other Israelite women did not intone and sing a new song, but rather repeated what Moses and the Israelite men first sang for them. The women sang just as an echo sound comes later. One could see this from their response at the beginning of the Song of Thanks. It must have been a powerful melody, a mighty sound and resounding of these two choruses. There were so many hundred thousand men and no fewer women and children joined together and singing. There has rarely ever been such a powerful song of joy sounded out on earth, except by the angels of God who sounded out at the birth of our Savior. Bach places an NB in the margin and adds the following comment. Festival prelude for two choirs to be sung to the glory of God. This is an important notation. The reference here is clearly to Bach's motet, Sing it dem Herrn, for two choirs, where one choir starts and the other choir follows, just as it's Kaloff is talking about. And then also, even the words timbrel and dance, tambourine and dance, are found in the text of the motet. Obviously, Bach has read this and inspired, and you can imagine then, then goes and writes Zingatame Herr. However, there's a problem. This brings up the whole question as to the proper date of the acquisition of the Bible. According to the new chronology of the Bach work, Zingatame Herr was composed during the year 1726 or 1727. The date Bach inscribed into his Bible is 1733. It makes no sense for the comment be placed, he placed within his Bible to writ, be written after the composition was completed. It makes only sense before. It's clearly an instance where Bach was influenced to compose this motet after reading the passage. Either the dating of the motet is incorrect, or the date inscribed in his Bible is not the date of acquisition, but a date much later. If it is the date of his Bible, 1733, and more study will, will find out if it's that time. If it is that date, that means the, the, the numbering or the dating of, of the compositions of Bach are all in question, all of them. According to the, 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 what they did in, in 1950, was they decided they, they needed to find, Bach never signed it and signed his composition and said this is June 2nd, 1786, and they never didn't do that. Uh, so we were left to, to wonder when they were written. So they used, the paper that he used to write the music on has watermark on it. And we know from the watermark what printer that came from. We know that printer came from, and when, he, when we do know of something that he wrote that has a date on it, or we know exactly when it was performed, without those watermark, then we can say the, all the other compositions with that same paper watermark probably done about in the same time. That's the theory. However, this may throw that completely out of the water, uh, which I think would be great. <laughs> and it would be a whole, whole new look at Bach and how his compositional process went. In summary, the Bach Bible is without question the most valuable evidence to date concerning the level of commitment Bach had to a personal faith in God. These markings serve to further the belief that Bach was indeed a devout Christian who took very seriously the word of God as revealed in scripture. He was not a casual believer who was employed in the service of the church, but a believer who studied scripture on a very personal and private level. The Kaloff Bible is also a record of Bach's interest in certain subjects and life struggles, 
and presents possible solutions to everyday problems and frustration Bach experienced in his dealing with others. The Kaloff Bible is also evidence of the scholarly nature of Johann Sebastian Bach. His Bible helps to present a view of this composer as an intellectual individual with a heightened sense of inquisitiveness. With the possibility that additional volumes from Bach's library might someday be uncovered, more light may be shed on the personal faith, the inner thoughts, and the personal disposition of Johann Sebastian Bach. This will add immeasurably to the knowledge of the personality, character, and compositional output of this illustrious composer. In turn, more could be learned about his compositional process and his innermost intentions in creating the many works of music we possess from his pen. Now, there is a book uh, that is out on, the, on a uh, table as you go into the library, uh, and it is a book published in 1740 in Leipzig, you may touch it, you may look at it, please don't take it, but it'll give you an idea of the same kind of paper, the same feeling uh, of that. Uh, it's, it's, it's made, it has pigskin around the, uh, the covers in pigskin, just like the Bach Bible. It'll give you a hands-on experience of, of what it. Be careful with it, please. It's 1740 is a long time ago. <clears throat> I want to tell that when I told you the story about being in the room with, with Bach was a mountaintop experience for me, as you can imagine. Uh, there I am with him. And other things I found. I have some hair that was embedded in there. I have food that was in there. I have tobacco that fell down into the, into the creases. We know that he was a tobacco smoker. So I have some hair, some hair, hair some tobacco. We probably could clone Bach and bring him back. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you one, one, uh, one more story, and then, or two things, and then we'll be done. In, <clears throat> whenever these Bibles are out, uh, it, it takes a huge amount of, of insurance. Uh, they're valued in the millions, uh, and uh, uh, the last time I had it out, I had to have $2 million worth of insurance in order to have it. And then you go personally fly to St. Louis and pick them up and carry them with you personally. Now. The safety is in anonym anonymity. They're in a suitcase or something that I'm carrying beside me. Nobody knows what it is. That's, that's safe, because they don't know me. They have no idea. When we, pos when we uh, displayed them in public, we had them on a table. You can look at it, but you can't touch. I'll have, I'll have gloves on. I'll, I'll gladly show you any page you want to look at. You can you look at it, but you can't touch it. So he turns, and he yells across the room, hey, John. This guy's got Bach's Bible. There's, the anonymity is gone, and I was in trepidation the rest of the time trying to get those things here. Funny kinds of things that happen. The other thing I want to tell you about very, very quickly and very briefly, I'm doing a study right now on Bach and the use of numbers. Bach loved numbers, and it is, it is all, and no one has done a complete study of this, and maybe no one can because he never wrote about it. But there are some numbers that are important, just briefly. Number 14, 27, and 41 are very important to Bach. Not uncommon at the time where people liked, liked numbers. But 14, if you take the letters of the alphabet, B is 2, A is 1, C is 3, H is 8, add those up, you get 14. So the name Bach is 14. By the way, the name Bach, B-A-C-H. How many of you have a name that's actually musical? B, B in German is B flat, H is B natural. So you have, and he signs his name in compositions using that very thing. Uh, so 14 is a number, which is Bach. 27 is very important to Bach because it's the Trinity. It's three cubed, three times three times three. 14 plus 27 equals 41, which is also the reverse of 14. 41 happens to be J.S. Bach. So the man Bach, just the man Bach, is not the complete man unless he has the Trinity with him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bach plus God equals the whole man, J.S. Bach. So we have fugues that are 14, measures, or 14 notes long. The B minor mass has 27 movements. And it would go, I could go on and on and on for this. In the B minor mass, there are five chief parts of the mass, the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, Agnus Dei. The Credo is in the center. 
The center is, the, is our, our uh, witness and our profession of faith. That has nine movements in it. What's the middle of nine? Five. So in the fifth movement, the fifth movement is the crucifixus. So here we have a two-hour work. The very center work is the crucifixus. Why? Because the cross is the center of Christendom. That movement is 54 measures long, 27 times 2. And halfway through that is a, is a cross in the tenor line. la di da da Not only is he an inc incredible composer, but he plays games for himself and never has, never tells anybody. In that same movement, the crucifixus, crucifixus, you've all heard it. There are 14 entrances of crucifixus, meaning Christ died even for me, bah, making it very personal. All those things were conjecture before the Bible. Now we can say there's some truth to this, and not just because we say we make that up, but because it happens over and over and over and over again in composition upon composition upon composition. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and so those, we're doing a study of that to find out all, all these relationships uh, with that. Uh, really neat. That's the end of my pre presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Please enjoy looking at this incredible document, once-in-a-lifetime event. Thank you.